We need the guy who makes all things new. Hurting world, boys and girls, low or low, we need you now. Live it, redeem it, please work it out. Yeah, yeah. Men's Ministry Virtual Summit. Uh, my name is Kevin Mills, and uh, today we are excited to have you with us. Uh, <clears throat> just a few weeks back, a man by the name of George Floyd was murdered on social media in front of the world, in front of this nation. Uh, in that same time frame, a young lady by the name of Breonna Taylor was shot and killed in her apartment. The country is suffering from a serious pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is uh, disproportionately affecting the black and brown community. At the same time, we have a president who is attacking our democracy. After just four years ago, seeing the first African-American president leave the White House, uh, we now are in a moment where the first African-American woman could be elected as the vice president. This is an exciting time and a very challenging time. The pandemic has tentacles stretched into education, politics, economics, people losing jobs. Folks are concerned about their children's education over the next several weeks. And uh, we are absolutely holding our breath on what's gonna happen next. Uh, not to this nation and to the world, but this call is about what's going to happen next for the African-American community. We put together a group of thought leaders to have a conversation with you. And we hope that you will join in that conversation and participate in this conversation as we hope to uplift each other and learn something today. Uh, before I turn it over to my uh, co-leader uh, uh, and co-moderator, Bernard Robinson, I do want to say a short prayer to get us started, um, and then we'll uh, we'll get the meeting going. So, if you would, just give me a moment. Just take a moment and have a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this day, for the opportunity to share 
uh, information. We ask you to guide the hearts and the minds and the thoughts of everyone on this call, uh, that they be uplifted to you and to your and to your to your kingdom. Father, we just ask you to make this a wonderful, successful meeting, a part one, and we look to next weekend to conclude in part two. We thank you again for the opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning. Um, <clears throat> okay. Yep. Uh, I left one part out. My brother, Justin Persons, who is the co-lead uh, of the Zion Woodbridge Men's Ministry, is here. You can raise your hand, brother Jess. Justin, he was a thought leader behind this meeting. Um, so uh, we thank him for his vision and leading the men's ministry at Zion Woodbridge campus. Uh, so I'll kick it over to you, brother Bernard. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to, again, as Kevin has mentioned, uh, Zion Church Woodbridge Men's Ministry 2020 Summit. Uh, my name, as he mentioned, is Bernard Robinson, and he and I are the moderators for what we hope will be an exciting time in, in our lives here this morning. Um, we're delighted that you've chosen to join us this morning. My understanding is that uh, there are approximately 70 people, at least from my look on yesterday, who'd registered for this time. So we're really happy that you uh, have joined in this summit learning experience. Um, I'd like you to also mark your calendars, if you would, for next Saturday, uh, when we conclude what we start today. Uh, it's part one, we'll finish part two next week. Now, I want to give a few preliminary comments and get us really jumping into our summit in our summit learning experience. But uh, let me uh, cover a few, what I call housekeeping points, if you will. One of the things that's been mentioned is that we've asked each presenter uh, at the time they began to speak and present to introduce themselves to dispense with the kind of introductions that can take uh, a good bit of time in the beginning. All of this designed to make sure we use the time as best we can for what we want to talk about in the summit and what we want to learn together in this summit uh, and help us run that smoothly and efficiently. Number two, uh, we've muted your mics, which you probably already recognize. And so we do that to minimize the interruption, if you will, from background noises. And as I understand it, to manage the sometimes unanticipated interruption that can come from out, uh, outside of the, the platform. Uh, number three, as we work together to make this a, an effective <clears throat> and valuable summit learning experience, um, we ask you to use the chat feature. Um, we're going to ask you to send your questions, your thoughts, and to be connected with us in that way so that we can kind of integrate what you are thinking with the questions you have into the conversation. We do want this to be a dialogue, and so uh, your involvement is, is extremely important and your questions are very valuable. And we thank you for uh, working with us in that way and being engaged uh, and cooperative in that respect. So let's get started. Uh, I want to introduce the program and get us started. Uh, in this audience, there are people who are carrying a host of differing responsibilities. We have women. We have men, we have boys and girls, all of different ages and different life conditions. Not only do we wanna thank you for being here, but we wanna get you to uh, consider very clearly the responsibility to help us make this uh, a really helpful uh, experience for all of us by one, having you involved. And what that means, if you will, number one is listening. And number two, uh, sending your questions in. Uh, what we'll do, though, is, as we said earlier, is to try to integrate those in a way that allows the conversation to really grow and be even richer because of your thoughts. Now, we have a particular question that we want to ask you to think about now. Even as we begin our presentation, you don't have the concluding of next week. But the question is this, what's next? Beyond the summit's conclusion next week, whether you are a mom or dad, 
whether you're a teenager, whether you're a college student, whether you're formerly, uh, formerly in, in an incarcerated state, whatever else would, re would reflect your particular life condition and your responsibility basket, if you will, what's next for you? Let me expand it just a bit. What is next for the outfit that you lead? That could be outfit meaning family, business. What's next? What's next for your community? What's next for Zion Church? And as we're here to consider, what's next for the African American community that Kevin spoke of clearly that will change because of the leadership that is now being fostered for us that we have an opportunity to vote in November on and that which we're even living with now. But the other question is what's next for our purposes this morning for the African-American community? And what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask Dr. Browder, Dr. Tony Browder, to get you thinking and us thinking and get our thinking started by giving us a snapshot of a historical perspective on protesting. And so I want us to jump right in there. And Dr. Brown, if you would, you can say and, and kind of introduce yourself. But I want to begin, I want to get you to listen again, send your questions, and be engaged. And that's exactly what we want to help have happen and we know that you've gained for it. So Dr. Browder, get us started, uh, get us moving. All right, thank you so much, uh, Brother Robinson. I appreciate that. And uh, I've been allotted nine minutes, so I want to use my time judiciously. And uh, I want to frame the, the question, what's next, and put that in context. Uh, there's an African proverb that says, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand not only uh, where we're going, but where we are now, how we got where we are, where we need to go, gain clarity on where we need to go and the best route to get there. So we've been protesting for a long time. It's important for us to understand why we protest and how effective protests have been, how ineffective protests have been, and to devise a new strategy to determine where we need to go and the best way to get there. Now, let me just give you some context in terms of telling you about myself uh, so that you have a framework for, for this discussion moving forward. I was born in Chicago 69 years ago, and I've lived my entire life in the United States of contradictions. We've been living with contradictions all of our lives. I was four years old when Emmett Till was killed. I was 10 when I became aware of prejudice in the United States. I was 14 when Malcolm was killed. I was 15 when Martin Luther King came to Chicago, and I witnessed him being hit in the head with a brick as he tried to integrate Market Park in Chicago. I was 17 when King was assassinated, and saw my community on the west side of Chicago burned to the ground, and 52 years later, it has not been rebuilt. I was 18 when Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were murdered in a house less than two miles from where I lived. And um, I was rescued by police when uh, my freshman class at Austin High School integrated that high school. And then two years later, I was harassed and robbed by the police. So I'm dealing with contradictions all of my life. I left Chicago to come to Howard University in 1971, graduated from Howard in 1974, and it wasn't until 1977 that I realized the extent to which I had been miseducated. I had never taken a class in black history in my entire life, but in 1977, I met Dr. Ivan Van Sertema at Georgetown Law School. Van Sertema had just published his first book, They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in America. And in that book, Van Sertema documented the fact that Africans had built ships, navigated the Atlantic Ocean, and visited the Americas 2,500 years before Christopher Columbus was born. It was at that moment that I realized that I had been lied to all of my life. And I also became aware of what I referred to as forbidden knowledge. There was information which has been um, intentionally withheld from people of African ancestry specifically in order to keep us in a certain mindset so that we would never uh, take advantage of inherent opportunities that we were born with. And so I've dedicated 
my career uh, to, to unpacking this forbidden knowledge, uh, accessing information that has been intentionally withheld from us and making that information available to the people with the greatest need to know so that we can act now with clarity based on things that we know that are real and not respond to other people's perceptions of reality. That's fundamental to where we go in the future. So let me give you a, a, a statement, a statement that was made by a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. His name is Henry Berry. That statement was made in uh, January 20th, 1832. And Berry, who was a politician, speaking to other politicians, laid out the framework which still impacts our lives today. He said, sir, we know so far as we have so far as possible close every avenue through which light may enter the slave's mind. If we could extinguish their capacity to see the light, then they would be on the level of the beasts of the fields. Our work would be complete and we would be safe. So what did he say? What did he mean? Back in 1832, he said that everything that the framers of the US Constitution, the creators of the United States of America, did was to separate us from the truth of who we were so that we would function on the level of the beast of the field. That was their mission. That would ensure their safety. So as we fast forward to the present moment, what I've come to realize is that we react to things that have been set in motion long before we were born. And we don't understand the parameters or the circumstances in which we have always lived our lives in which our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents have lived their lives. So it's important that we go back and retrieve the knowledge that was illegal here in the United States of America. If you go to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, one of the things that you'll see in the exhibit called A Paradox of Liberty is the statement that 12 of America's first, that nine of America's first 12 presidents enslaved Africans. Right? And so if we unpack that even more, the first US presidents were all born in Virginia. George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and James Monroe. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, which stated that all men are created equal, but yet in the Declaration of Independence, Africans were not considered men. James Madison, when he wrote the Constitution of the United States of America, stated in Article 1, Section 3, they considered people of African ancestry, us, as three-fifths of a man. So this whole system was designed to see us as less than human, and circumstances were created that would always deny us the knowledge to step into our full humanity. So if we don't understand the basics, the basic foundation upon which this nation was established, and how we have been living our lives, then we will never be able to live up to our potential as people of African ancestry. And so let me give you this other framework and then, and then I can step back. I just wanna put some thoughts and ideas for us to think about and discuss. If you go to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, which is two blocks away from the Smithsonian Museum of, of African American History and Culture, in that museum, there is an exhibit in the David Polk Hall of Human Origins. That exhibit is about 17 years old. That exhibit costs $15 million. And what that exhibit does is lay out the development of humanity um, in the world. And I wanna give you four basic takeaways from that exhibit, which should frame our discussion about who we are, how we got where we are, and what's next, and the best way to get there. That exhibit says, <clears throat> 200,000 years ago, Africans were the only human beings on the planet. Now this is scientifically proven fact. 200,000 years ago, Africans were the only people on the planet. 65,000 years ago, a group of Africans living in East Africa walked east into Asia and populated Asia. The exhibit also says that 30,000 years ago, another group of Africans walked west into Europe and populated Europe. Now, if we put a pin in those three points, then what that means is Africans were the first people on the planet. Africans were the first people 
in Asia. Africans were the first people in Europe. So why don't we know this information? Why has that information never been taught to us? And what is the impact of this knowledge intentionally being withheld from us so that we never fully understand who we are, what we've done, how we got where we are, and what it is that we have the capacity to do? The, the last point that I'll leave you with so that we can have more time to discuss things that are important to us and our ability to move forward is that geneticists four years ago have identified the genes that people classified as white, i.e. Caucasians carry, uh, the gene that represents their, uh, their loss of melanin and, and the gene that indicates when white people became white. And that gene is only seven to 8,000 years old. Now process this. If African people have been on the planet for at least 200,000 years, and the people classified as Europeans have, been only, have only been on the planet uh, approximately seven to 8,000 years, it means that we have a 192,000 year head start. Why don't we know that information? And what impact would the internalization and the operation of that information in our lives change in our relationship with the people who have oppressed us here in this country for at least 401 years. So knowledge is the key to us freeing ourselves and determining where we're going to go and to be able to move out of the mode of protesting and think and act in a manner that our oppressors will have to respond to us in a manner that's favorable to us and our descendants. That is where we find ourselves at this critical point in time in history. And I am confident that if we invest in ourselves and knowing what others made illegal, we would change the dynamic and live the rest of our lives as free thinking, free functioning human beings. I yield my time back to the forum. Uh, Bernard, you are muted and we can't hear you. You're still muted. I am unmuted now. I apologize. That's uh, no problem. Sure I have to kind of get my act in order here. Uh, Doc, Dr. Brown, I want to thank you one for just laying it out there for us. And I have one question for you, uh, just to kind of extend our thinking uh, just a bit. And I won't ask you to take too long on it. Um, how do we maintain this notion of active consciousness after the protests are over? Spend a half minute or so on that. What do we do to actually, you, you said a couple of good things. In fact, I wrote here, think and act in a new way. I put new in there. Sure. Give us your sense of how do we maintain an activist consciousness? Okay, um, two points I wanna make real quick. Um, at the funeral, for um, uh, John, John Lewis. John Lewis. <clears throat> Bill Clinton created a stir when he criticized Stokely Carmichael, mm -hmm. right? There is a interview with Stokely Car Carmichael, Kwame Ture on YouTube that every person should watch. And the essence, the theme of that uh, presentation is how to make the unconscious conscious of their unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. That's the deal, that's the issue that we're dealing with. We don't know, and we don't know that we don't know. Mm -hmm. So until you become conscious of the fact that you are unconscious, and then become aware of the things that you need to know, and then implement and act on that awareness, then you will change the dynamic of everything and everyone around you. So Bill Clinton, at the funeral wanted to reinforce the suppression of the knowledge of us becoming conscious of our unconsciousness and then acting as a conscious people. That is still happening right now. Just very quickly, repeat the uh, video that you mentioned that folks can go and find. Sure, it's uh, Stokely Carmichael, AKA Kwame Ture, and his talk, Making the Unconscious Conscious of Their Unconsciousness. Very good, thank you, brother. You're uh, okay, uh, with that being said, let me ask Ethelbert if you'll take us to the next point. And the next point is, why protest? If, if Dr. Bart is laying out the history and giving us a solid context, 
why protest? Does it really matter? He mentioned earlier that in fact, sometimes protests did things that were useful and sometimes they didn't. So Ethelbert, give us a perspective, uh, if you will, on why protest? Does it really even matter? Thank you, Bernard, and thank you, um, Brother Browder. Um, I wanna begin my remarks um, by reading a poem by Sterling A. Brown. The poem is Olim. I selected this poem with the hope that it might put in perspective uh, my comments about protest and, and why we should protest. Sterling Brown was the first poet laureate of Washington, DC. He was a professor at Howard University for, for many years. Many of the young civil rights workers often visited him in his Northeast um, home. He was very encouraging and supportive of their actions. I have a picture here, if you can see this is Sterling Brown in his home on 1222 Kearney Street, Northeast. One person who often quoted Brown was Mayor Marion Barry, who got his start in politics as a young activist with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Brown died in 1989. This poem, Old Lamb, was written in the 1930s. Old Lamb. I talked to Old Lamb, and Old Lamb said, they weigh the cotton, they store the corn. We only good enough to work the roads. They run the commissary, they keep the books. We gotta be grateful for being cheated. Whippersnapper clerks call us out of our name. We got to say Mr. to Spindling Boys. They make our figures turn Somerset. We buck in the middle, say thank you, sir. They don't come by ones. They don't come by twos, but they come by tens. They got the judges, they got the lawyers, they got the jury roles, they got the law. They don't come by ones. They got the sheriffs, they got the deputies. They don't come by twos. They got the shotguns, they got the rope. We get the justice in the end. They come by tens. Their fists stay closed, their eyes look straight. Our hands stay open, our eyes must fall. They don't come by ones. They got the manhood, they got the courage. They don't come by twos. We got to slink around, hang tail hounds. They burn us when we dogs, they burn us when we men. They come by tens. I had a buddy, six foot of a man, muscle up perfect, game to the start. All right, they don't come by ones. Outworked and outfought any man or two men. They don't come by twos. He spoke out of turn at the commissary. They gave him a day to get out of the county. He didn't take it. He said, come and get me. They came and got him. And he came by tens. He stayed in the county. He lays there dead. They don't come by ones. They don't come by twos. But they come by tens. Stone Brown. When we hear the word protest, it should never be viewed in a negative light. Protest is positive. Too often we become concerned with peaceful, nonviolent protests versus angry, violent protests. And what happens is that our conversations focuses on violence and nonviolence and pushes aside to the side the word protest. A protest is to commit an act of disapproval to something. It's a way of expression that one objects or is in opposition to something or someone. We protest when we are denied something, something like our civil and human rights. Ask yourself, what should you have a right to? Good housing, healthcare, education, a job, even maybe access to the internet. What would you do if you were denied those rights? or your children denied those rights. You could think about what's coming up here in the fall, where all of a sudden our children are gonna have to learn virtually. Well, what happens if you don't have access to the internet? What happens to your child? Many protests are often youth movements. Why? Because protest calls for change. It is young people who challenge the status quo. It's often young people who lose their innocence when society attempts to deny them something. 
It might be something as simple as walking down the street and refusing to be stopped by the police. If you look around the world, it is young people who are protesting. This is how it was in the 1960s. I would make reference to this. When you think about the Black Lives Matter movement, it's international. And if you look at youth movements, the key one is probably in Hong Kong, where you see young people battling for democracy. The same way we are concerned as we move towards November, what is going to happen to our vote? What is going to happen to our democracy? But when you look internationally, some of the techniques and tactics used in Hong Kong are being picked up here in the United States. And the things that we're doing here in the United States is being picked up in places like Africa or England. And so we need to realize that when we talk about our protests, it is not local, it's international. Now, protest movements are also led by women. Women started the Black Lives Movement. And I was telling the brothers just the other day, it's women who started that Black Lives Movement. And when we want to get specific, they were Black lesbian women. Okay, and that's why when you have this banner of Black Lives Matter, it raises a lot of questions about not just race, but also sex and gender. And we have to be concerned about how we keep our movement together and don't become fractured. But women started the Black Lives Movement. Our civil rights movement will always honor women and should always honor women, not forget, not just King and Abernathy and people like that, Angel Randall but, and, and, and John Lewis, but people like Fran Beale, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, Septima Clark, Joyce Ladner, and don't forget the voices of the movement, Mahalia Jackson, Bernice Reagan, Odetta, and Aretha Franklin. Each one of those women is part of the movement. And don't just think if you listen to Bernice Reagan that you just listen to her voice, or like you go back into the March on Washington, that I have a dream speech. Some people tell you that it's Mahalia Jackson who had sung before King, who said what he was saying, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream. And then, then, then some historians say, well, we, we saw Mahalia Jackson sitting there. We don't know if, if King heard her. <laughs> You're not going to hear Mahalia Jackson. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you, know, you want to give this woman credit because King had given this speech before. Mahalia had heard it. You see, in fact, if you go back, so when King is leaning over that balcony in, in Memphis, the last thing he said, like, sing, sing precious Lord, okay? And, and what happened, Mahalia Jackson was singing that, singing that song, you know? So you have to put her voice, and Bernice Reagan, who lives here in DC, is one of the original freedom singers, okay? And so we have to look at the women, and when you think of these women as, 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 as singers, also see them as thinkers and organizers. They're not just a pretty voice, okay? But it started long before them. To protest is to embrace the motion of history. Every day, each one of us, when we wake up and go outside, we are responsible for making history. If I say anything else this morning, keep that. That's a very empowering way of how you, when you take that first step, get that first <laughs> sniff of the air, okay? Or when you send your children out, tell them they have the capability of making history. Okay, that is extremely important to do. Now, protest begins with two words, two very simple words. You even heard these words before. No, <laughs> I will not accept it. If you will hear our parents, we know we heard that. <laughs> you know, do something. No, <laughs> we heard that protest. We try to make sure that protest don't get to the street. <laughs> We're right in our own house. We have to deal with that. Because our child might sometimes we, we have to learn a lot from our children. But the first word that when you with, 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 with protest, one is no, I will not accept this. And the second is yes, I can do something about it. Yes, I can do something about it. Now, protest does not walk alone. It has a bride or groom. That bride or groom is called struggle. Struggle is the push and pull of history. Struggle like protest is as vital and as essential as air. Essential as air. This is why the words, I can't breathe, becomes important to all of us. To breathe is to live. You have a right to your life. If someone tries to stop you from breathing, your body, your body will protest. Just try it. Somebody stop you from breathing. Your body is going to say, no, I'm not going to take this. It's going to resist. 
okay? It is the natural thing for the body to do. So when you say, well, why people, no, it's the natural thing to do. And now let me close my remark by directing all of us back to a document that underscores the importance of protest and the how and why of protest. On April 16, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail. And this letter is probably much more important than I have a dream speech. This letter is very, very important. I encourage you all to use your cell phone later today, Google it, read it, and you will find it's very fitting because King directs this letter, direct this letter to white clergymen. See, now you could you could even teach the letter. Say, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna teach the letter. But who's the letter addressed to? It's not like a wrong address. It's addressed to white clergymen, okay? People in the church, okay? Who felt that King was an outsider to their city of Birmingham, that he was a troublemaker and the culprit behind the protest against segregation. And it is in this letter, it is in this letter that King says something we always heard. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It's in his letter. See, you might see something like that on a poster. <laughs> you see like somebody sampled it, you know, from the, from the letter, but no, that comes out. And this is why this letter is very important, even more important than his dream speech. Now, it is also in this letter in which he tells the clergyman, why are you so much in opposition to the protests when you are silent when one talks about the reasons and the conditions that give rise to protest? This is so important, even when we deal with our, our, our puns and, and, and people on TV and radio, okay? Are they always things to protest? But why are people protesting? What are the conditions? See, and I mentioned this in terms of labor issues. Whenever a strike comes up, the media tells you what? That it is going, this strike by postal workers or, 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 or you know, bus drivers or whatever, nurse is going to be an inconvenience to you, the citizen. It's gonna be an inconvenience. So all of a sudden you say, I gotta get to work. Or I, where's, where's the nurses? They never tell you why are people striking? <laughs> what are their conditions? Okay, that is, I never, and the reason why you don't get there is because the, the, the radio station, TV stations, and newspapers are having problems with unions of their own. <laughs> so they're not going to really tell people why they should be protesting. But that is something to think about. Okay. And also in King's letter, there is a blueprint and path to follow when we decide to protest. He writes, in any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps collection of facts to determine whether injustice exists, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. Let me just underscore two of the four, collection of facts and self-purification. Because we live in a time of fake news, and social media, we have to get our facts straight before we protest. That is so key, okay? Second, self-purification. Ask yourself, if you are ready to go out into the streets and why, okay? Ask yourself if you were, remember that scene in um, Boys in the Hood, Lawrence Fishburne and, 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 and Cuba Gooding, where he wanted to go out <laughs> and because Lawrence Fishburne was there, he could hold his son back, you know? But ask yourself, you're gonna run out into the street. Why are you running out into the street? Are you ready for that? You see, see some people, some, some, there's a generation like they go out there and, and, and they have no respect for the police. <laughs> you know, don't, don't touch me, you know? And what happened, they're not, they may not be ready spiritually to be hit upside the head and not hit back because we have people, they're defiant. But you have to know why you're going out into the street. Now, let me just end on these things. Um, the self figure it's key because you're preparing yourself to love, to love yourself and to love others, to uphold and protect what's there and just to you. But it's also, you have to be concerned about the about your neighbor, and then you may be ready. And also it's important, know what you want to change. Then think about how that change can be implemented, okay? okay King I'm, writes that I'm we know, hmm? I'm gonna break it on your Okay, bit. okay, I'm just, I'm just one, one line, okay? Uh, King says in, in, in this letter, we, we, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. So understand there will be opposition and always remember this. They don't come by ones. They don't come by twos. They come by tens.
Good deal. Thank you so much, brother. And, and listen, I, I apologize for breaking in, but I want to make us keep us moving. Sure. I want to say that uh, both you and Dr. Brother have given us an excellent perspective uh, so the panelists can kind of dig in uh, as we get into the next part of the discussion, which is strategies. Um, I want to get the panelists, and I've kind of given the order already, so I won't repeat that. And I asked the panelists to, um, to begin the process of unpacking what this protesting history shares and tells us, and what uh, this notion of rationale uh, that um, Ethelbert has laid out uh, means and says to them. And so I'd ask Sean to start the process, and of course, uh, you have the order from yesterday, but we're gonna go ahead and create this conversation and enlighten ourselves and each other and question you and each other so that we can get to a place where those who are listening, all of those who are listening, and those who will listen on and come on can get into this conversation, this dialogue, and, 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 and help us uh, unpack this. So with that being said, Sean, if you'll start us, and then the other guys in the order that you, you saw there, go on and pick in and just uh, work with one another we want to listen, learn, and of course, ask whatever questions you want. Sean, go for it. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Williams. I am an attorney, actually a senior associate with the law office of Thomas C. Piles, located in Waldorf. But um, I, I, I'm actually going to start with, and you know, I've always said this in the prior conversations that we've had as a group is, is, is protest and even effective? Um, and and I'll, and I'll start with what uh, Dr. Ethelbert, what you ended with, which was the snippet from Dr. King, where he said, uh, we must demand freedom from our oppressors. And in, in saying that, what if your oppressor says no, then what? What do you do after that? So it takes me back to uh, one of my favorite books in the Bible, Exodus, um, and just going back to Moses and when God told Moses to go free his people. And that was what Moses, Moses did first. He went to Pharaoh and asked Pharaoh, let my people go. That was his demand. And Pharaoh said, no. And it wasn't, and, and you know, Moses didn't go back to his people and say, okay, it's at this point, we need to march a Pharaoh's yard and get something done. What had to occur was God had to bring about the plague. Something had to happen that actually touched the Egyptians. And it goes back to what Dr. Brada said. It says, oppressor has to respond to us. What, how does it affect your oppressor? And even before I even go back, I do not want to paint oppressor as a person. Uh, Ephesians 6, 12 still reigns supreme. The enemy is not against, the enemy is not flesh and blood, it's powers and principalities. So we, we cannot, you know, I think one of the greatest things that the enemy has done is being able to convince that if I look at my brother, he's my enemy, when there is really something greater behind that. But as to, as to bringing about change, as to demanding freedom from your oppressor, the next question is, if they say no, what are you willing to do to have them have to respond to you? And it, it, honestly, in my honest opinion, when I think of protesting, I honestly do not believe protesting, see protesting as, you know, and everyone has their own views and opinions, but getting in the streets and marching, I see it as what you indicated, Dr. Ethelbert, as to, uh, uh, protesting is making history that everyone has the capability or capacity to protest every day you wake up. How do you bring about change, not only to yourself, but to the people around you? That's true po protesting, whether it be in a micro sense or in a mi macro sense, that's really true protesting. So uh, to me is how are we, and I hate to answer a question with a question, but the question to me, and just to piggyback of what Dr. Broda said, how are we making our oppressor respond? If we're getting out in the streets and marching, that's fine and dandy, but what's changed? We've been protesting for 400 years, being in the streets and marching. What's changed? We're still dealing with the exact same issues that we were dealing with 
back then. So, you know, again, we do not have God's ability to bring about plague, but what are we doing to, to actually cause the oppressor to respond, to bring about the change that we want? And I guess the ultimate change would be what the, 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 the people of God wanted back then in Exodus was freedom, true freedom. Um, so I, I'll leave it at that. You're on mute, uh, Mr. Robinson. I said, uh, whoever's next, go for it. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't I don't have my list right in front of me, but you know who's next. Great. Yep, that would be me. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Robinson. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Marlon DeBusen. I'm the Young Adult Committee Chairman for the Fairfax County uh, NAACP. Uh, so I know many of you are in Prince William County, so we're your your neighbors to the north. Um, yeah, I went to Christian Newport University for undergrad, got my degree in business administration, um, then got my master's at George Mason in public policy with a uh, concentration in social policy and US government institutions. I mean, you know, using policy uh, in order to make change uh, is, is vital to the African-American community um, because as Sean just said, you know, you could be in the streets protesting, but if there's no end result of some tangible action items and legislation, then, you know, you're essentially, you know, using your voice and your legs, your lungs, your, your signs, whatever it may be, um, for no end result. Um, so it, it's essential that we enforce policy that we don't have to continue protesting um, and this doesn't reoccur in five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it may be. Um, professionally, I'm the outreach director uh, for Congressman Jerry Connolly. Um, in the last three months, I've been uh, pretty active uh, within the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's what I'll be uh, focusing on uh, throughout this panel discussion of uh, uh, the protests and the rallies that I've attended, that I've planned, um, and that I've been able to experience. Um, so, you know, Part of what Dr. Browder said, uh, he spoke of our history being uh, distorted. And a big piece of that shows why progress has been so slow um, in uh, the civil rights movement uh, in the African-American community. You know, I was a product of Fairfax County Public Schools and they taught us that pretty much we were in a post-racial society after Dr. King was assassinated, that racism pretty much ended from there. Um, they taught us that, uh, that Malcolm X was too violent and shouldn't be looked on as an icon. Uh, so you had those in power, the, press, the pressures being the ones teaching how our history should be taught. And because of that, often, uh, young African Americans get confused in when racism happens because they are under the impression that, hey, in school I was taught that racism ended when the Civil Rights Act passed uh, after Dr. King's assassination. But in, in reality, the Civil Rights era has never ended. Uh, the torch has just been passed on. So why and how is everything happening right now? Um, you know, it goes back to the excuses, the lack of action, uh, prolonging of justice and accountability, uh, and the economic fallout and disproportionate effects that it's having on the Black community right now. Uh, in, with George Floyd being killed, that was, that was the final spark that set the bomb off. Uh, so it's how we perceive it. This could have happened you know, four months before COVID-19 and the economic downturn. And I'm not sure we've had the same reaction, but since everything aligned the way it did, you had this huge cry out and this huge response. And with protesting, I will say millennials, I'm, I'm 25 myself, I will say millennials, we are very different in how we protest, uh, the use of social media, the use of getting the word out quickly, um, through video, pictures, uh, tagging friends, 
um, you know, the, the guys and I, we were all on a Zoom earlier this week and we always, they were joking that, you know, if, if it's not on your phone within three, five seconds, your, your attention span is lost and you're moving on. So how do you engage quickly to get a call of action? And, you know, I tell people that protesting in the streets isn't for everybody. Uh, you know, going, I've been in protests in Prince William County, Fairfax County, um, Washington, D.C., I mean, it's not for everyone. Um, there's the first weekend uh, I was out there from 11 a.m. Uh, till about 2, 3 a.m. Um, and from 11 a.m. to you know 1 a.m., everything was fine. Uh, from 1 a.m. to about 3 a.m., that's when some of the trouble happened. And that's, and that's just unfortunately how it's gonna be sometimes, um, you know, both on Saturday and Sunday, you know, I've experienced during a protest, I was shot by a rubber bullet. I had a flashbang go off right in front of me. Uh, smoke, smoke grenades were sent off. Uh, so all of this, it, it can be, you know, a little traumatizing, um, you know, when you're in that moment, when you're there with nothing but a sign and a water bottle and you're faced with riot gears, batons, and these other, you know, military style uh, uh, tactics from uh, those who are supposed to, supposedly there to serve and protect you. But I think the biggest thing with protesting now is seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, seeing what we can do. And the reason I believe protesting is so effective um, is because you see the full change that is needed. So throughout these last, I've been protesting now in some capacity for 12 weeks straight. So through these protests, it changes the narrative from we need law enforcement change, which we do, but it changes it from we need law enforcement change to we need a full systematic overhaul. Because we see okay. that. Well, yes. well, let me bring it on you, brother. Okay. Okay. Let me finish. I'm going to finish this last one. So we need the law enforcement aspect is is just as important, but we see that we need changes in healthcare where black women die at disproportionate rates um, than white women during childbirth. We need reinforcement in our education system where black students have higher student loans than white students. Okay, I'm gonna uh, pass, pass it along, Nick. I'm gonna get your other brothers. Yeah, so I, and I think Nate is next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, so we need this full systematic reinforcement um, and I'll pick up on that point um, later on in this discussion. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Go for, go for it now, Sandra. Um, good morning, everyone. So um, I'm Nate Benjamin, um, and I serve as a senior uh, career appointee um, in the federal government. I'm additionally, the principal of um, Benjamin and Associates Consulting Group, and I also serve as the director of operations here at Zion Church Woodbridge. And so um, one of the areas that I want to focus on in terms of protesting is beginning with the end in mind. That is um, a terminology that was uh, shared by Stephen Covey. And what it does is it, it, it focuses on what is your strategy and what it is that you want to do. And so as we know through the civil rights movement, there were different people who played different parts. And so there were those that were on the front line who were um, it, uh, marching. We know that those there were those that were behind the scenes who were providing financial support. We know that there, there were those that were elected, um, trying to get into elected, uh, becoming elected officials to make change. And so part of what um, I want to just discuss very briefly is the role of um, politics and finances in terms of protest. And when we hear protest, oftentimes people think about going down to DC, marching in Black Lives Matter, wearing uh, the paraphernalia in, in order to show your support. But there are many opportunities for people to be able to support when it comes to finances and when it also comes to um, what you're supporting politically. So I'll give you an example. Now, um, as we know, we are approaching a, um, an, ele we're in an, ele in an election year. And so there are people who are campaigning in order to get your vote. And so one opportunity that I had was someone who reached out to me to, um, in essence, get a check. 
And they said, you know, um, we want you to support this candidate. We believe that this candidate aligns with your views. And absolutely they do. However, what am I going to be able to get and what am I going to be able to campaign for when it comes to me writing this check? Now, I don't have the money that many of these um, uh, millionaires do, but I also want to be able to show that where my money goes, I can help direct it. And so for this particular uh, campaign, I was able to meet with the subcommittee and speak to what my interests were and how my interests aligned to what it was that they were campaigning for. And so oftentimes there are so many opportunities to be able to protest, but you have to be able to be wise and be strategic in your protest. When we think about um, the uh, boycotts in Alabama, um, uh, in Montgomery, Alabama and the uh, bus boycotts, it wasn't necessarily just because of the inequalities that occurred. It was that that infrastructure was almost bankrupt because they did not have the black support when it came to those who were riding on the bus. And so many of the people who just decided at that point in time not to get on the bus for that year, they were protesting and they were protesting with their money and their money and their money um, and the absence of it in that system helped evoke change. So one of the things that I always want to highlight is that it's everyone has the opportunity to protest. Everyone should protest, but also recognize what is important to you, where are your interests, and align your protests with the interests because even if we are uh, protesting in different ways, it's all to the commonality, which is improving the experience for African-Americans in the United States. Um, I'll also add quickly that working in the diversity and inclusion space, we are seeing a boom of people wanting uh, strategists and consultants to come into their organizations to help. But oftentimes, the reason why they're looking for us to come in, they've known that these challenges have existed in organizations from years on years. And that's why they create affinity groups. And that's why they have harassment policies, anti-harassment policies and all of these things. But now their bottom line may be impacted. Organizational leaders have been, in essence, uh, they, they've been tied, their hands have been tied. They've watched each other to see if their organizations are going to put out Black Lives Matter statements and anti discrimination statements. This is occurring because some people see it as the right thing to do, but universally and collectively, this all has to go back to that bottom line. So if we can push them to make changes and make those changes, a direct impact of the financial bottom line, then whether we change hearts, that's not our place, but our place is to be able to get the equality that we so deserve. Good deal, good deal. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Let me just do this. I wanna lay out something. I'm gonna lay it out in three parts for the entire panel, including a Dr. Brown and Esselberg, but I wanna know that we can't, we're gonna move this quickly, if you will, but here's my, here's my thought. There's a question that uh, was raised during our conversation, even during the outline. And one of the questions was, what's the ask? I'm gonna stay there for a minute. And then the second part of this is, what is the role of black youth beyond marching? So that's the second point. And then the third one is, what's the elders role in protesting? Because as uh, Marlon quite, in, 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 quite aptly indicated, not everybody's into or going to be able to march, but you can do other things. So would the panelists in general respond to the notion of, well, let me start with the easier one first. What's the role of the black youth beyond marching? What do they do? What are they, because we're talking about the how, we've got kind of the what, we've got kind of the why, but now we're talking about the how. What's the role of the black youth beyond marching? Uh, how do they, uh, protest, if you will, or what is it they need to consider? Uh, and then if you would, after that, I'll keep time. We'll get into the notion of the elders role and we'll finally get into the question of what, what's the ask. And then we're gonna open it up to, to all of the participants on the line. So panelists, if you would, uh, what's the role of black youth? Uh, we're gonna spend about two or three or four minutes on that and then we'll move us on. 
I guess I'll start first because I guess that's how we're going sequentially. I'll start first. Okay. I actually think um, the two questions, what's the role of the youth and what's the role of the elder coincide. It's one and one. You can't, you cannot separate, you can't separate them. Okay. Um, and I actually think we need to start with what's the role of the elder first. Okay. The role of the elder and I think Marlon touched on this when he was speaking as to he was taught what he was taught in school. The role of the elder is to teach. Um, is for us to literally sit down and listen. The youth is for them to sit down and listen to the elder. So the elder might not have the energy to go back out to protest or whatever, however you view protesting. And that the youth has the energy. But the elder is to teach the youth, okay, this is what worked for us when we did it, and this is what didn't work. Avoid the mistakes that we had to go through, build on the foundation that we've already laid out for you, and make it work for you. There is not going to be, we, we can't solve the problem or the issue with one generation. It's going to be a building block. And I think we were discussing about that. We discussed this as to the land of milk and honey. What does your land of milk and honey look like? If you look again, going back to Exodus and channel going into numbers at this point, if you look at the progression from when Moses started to when the when they, the chosen folks finally got to their land of milk and honey, it was a building block. People literally built a foundation and someone else built on top of it. So the role of the elder is to teach and the role of the youth is to act on what they've been taught. Yeah, good. Next person. Yeah, I um, I do agree with Sean um, that, you know, the roles there are, but I do think you, you could still separate the two, um, you know, through this movement. It, it needs to be a younger movement. It needs to be the youth doing it. Uh, like I said, I'm 25 and I see people around my age and younger being on the front lines of this. Uh, but I also have, you know, I, I seek guidance from those who are older than me and those who have, uh, you know, done it in the past. Uh, but if you do run into the issue of, you know, Bernard, we called, you know, you were saying that you're the OG earlier uh, right. this week. But, you know, the, the OGs, you know, they say, this is good, but, and it, they sometimes try to change what you're doing. But us on the in the ground right now, we know uh, the best course of action. Uh, we 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 are putting our best foot foot forward, and it might not be the old ways. And and sometimes the the elders need to understand that you know they can't be the ones dictating how everything goes because the role of the youth right now is to um, build your capital um, in America, as uh, Nate was saying. Uh, to be the professionals, to be in this leadership positions, to be the elected officials, uh, because it's the youth that will be making that change going forward. You know, we'll take the, the elders' advice, of course, but we need to be the ones um, driving this ship. Good deal. Thank you. Nathaniel, go for it. And then, and then we'll jump out to uh, Ethelbert and Dr. Brown. Go for it. Absolutely. So um, I, I would absolutely agree with everything that Marlon and Sean said. Um, but one area that I want to throw in there is that we're talking about the youth and we're talking about the elders, but I think that we're missing that middle generation, which is my generation, right? So I'm closer to 40. So I definitely not 25, but I'm definitely not 65. And so what we know is with that generation, that's especially between the 40s and the 50s, those are your build, that's your building generation. That's the people who are more established. Those are the people who are working for when they become elders, but we also recognize the, 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 the space that the youth serve in. So what I would say is I think that we want to ensure that my generation are um, setting our children up and creating access opportunities. When we were on our call, one of the things that uh, we mentioned was that how did, how did a lot of us get to where we are in our lives right now? You know. Um, I'm blessed to be on a panel full of very accomplished African American men. And one of the stories that I shared was that, you know, my 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 um, bridge to get to where I was where I wanted to go was seeing a different world when I was a kid, right? And a different world set the framework to show that, you know, I wanted to go to college, I wanted to be successful, I wanted to do these things. But one of the things that 
um, you learn once you do some of those things is you have to be able to reach back, right? So my generation, what we're supposed to be doing is reaching back to the youth and providing them support while also serving as a bridge and working with our elders because we serve as that conduit between the two and we have to ensure that that message isn't lost. So what I would add to the conversation is to ensure that that generation X, if you will, um, are serving as that bridge between the baby boomers and the Gen Zs so that we are able to translate the, the powerful messages from the youth while also being able to take that wisdom and serve as a bridge. We are a community, we're doing this together. So let's not, let's, let's, let's use our spaces in order to affect change. Terrific, and by, by the way, uh, panelists, if you're listening, not panelists, but the audience, if you're listening, in about seven minutes, we're gonna be asking you to formulate your questions and be able to share them out loud and we'll try to respond to them. But I wanna give uh, Dr. Browder and Ethelbert an opportunity and Kevin as well to weigh in for a minute. And uh, then we're gonna jump into asking those who have been listening to weigh in with us directly. So uh, hold on a minute and we'll be right with you. So uh, other thoughts, uh, Ethelbert? Or yeah, I'll talk about the elder since I'm an elder. Um, one of the key things is providing a moral compass. And I think that is extremely important. You know, many times, you know, we can get lost, but the elders should hopefully provide a moral compass. And that is very difficult because sometimes what happens is that you're looking at, like say an ocean, you're, you're getting a sense of, okay, we have to go far. Some people can't see the horizon. And, 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 and if your movement doesn't have a moral compass provided by your elders, then all of a sudden, you know, you look up and your movement can collapse. The other thing is that elders have to invest in their youth. You know, one of the things I do, um, and maybe Tony Browder does it, you know, I've been giving away my library. You mm -hmm. know, I've been giving my way to actual things that, for, for young people, you know, that they have. I know if I go out and, and, and I'm taking somebody to, to lunch or dinner, I pay that bill. Mm -hmm. If a young person says, okay, I want to try to make this film or whatever, you know, for Black Lives Matter, I know I have to at least, to some extent, give some seed money, you know, for them to get started. You know, I'll go back to Sterling Brown when I was at Howard. I was selling Black Collegiate magazines, you know, take a look so I can have some little lunch money. And Sterling Brown brought five copies, <laughs> you know. You know, he brought five copies, just helping me out, okay? So I say that in terms of actually giving money. That gets back to what Nate was saying. See, somebody has to provide that finances and elders have to do it. And then yeah. the other thing, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I made many references to Sterling Brown and, and, and Marion Barrett loving it. But you can't be a Mugabe, okay? <laughs> you gotta know how to step aside. You know, I don't care if you run the Ebony Magazine or BET, you got to know when to step aside. If there's something happening in the black jeans or something like that, that we don't want to step aside. We, if we start something, we want to be there forever. At yeah. least put our name on the building after we did. But what happened, we don't know how to step aside, you know? And, and that's why sometimes we have a hard time, like, you know, with democracy. You know? But that's one of the things that elders have to, you know, know how to step aside. Good deal. Dr. Browder, talk to us. Uh, there, there's so much to unpack. Uh, oh, let, me just, yeah. let me just reference a couple of points. I have a good colleague of mine who's a psychiatrist, uh, lectures internationally. She told me that she had spoken in Palestine a number of years ago. And after a talk, uh, someone came to her and asked her, is it true that in America, you black Americans send your children to be educated by white Americans, the descendants wow. of the same people who oppressed them? Wow. We would never do that in Palestine. So wow. I go back to my, 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 my statement that if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. If you think about the significance of what Carter G. Woodson wrote, if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about their actions. And Woodson, toward the end of his life, said that it took him, Woodson was the second African-American to receive a degree from Harvard University. Woodson said it took him 40 years to get Harvard out of his mind. So it's about consciousness and understanding who controls the consciousness. And I'll close with this point. Um, this, this current generation is the smartest generation of unconscious people ever produced by this society. Wow. Isn't that, isn't that phenomenal? That is quite a statement. Let me just say, um, um, Anyone else, Kevin? You got anything before we go? Well, I just want to—I just want to share that uh, this has been a great conversation, and this is amazingly filling 
to hear hear these points of view. We do have a couple of questions from uh, from our audience, so let me let's just keep the, the party moving, and I'll share the first question from a guy Tony on Facebook, and he's asking, "What is the most effective response we can hope to achieve now, and how can we keep this narrative going?" We're wanting to re redesign a system that's been uh, in place hundreds of years. And Dr. Brown, I'll give you a, a quick throw it. I'll throw it to you first. Uh, and any other I, I said that you can't solve a problem using the same consciousness that created it. So right. it's about shifting your consciousness and realizing you've got other options available to you to destroy the problem so that you never have to deal with it again. And, and that is what's required. We've got to do the homework to know ourselves, to understand all of those things that our oppressor kept away from us in order to keep us in the position that we have found ourselves in for at least the last 150 years. It, it, it requires a profound shift of consciousness on our part. And I want to weigh in as well on that same point, Kevin, uh, because one of the things that I believe has to happen is to understand Kind of picking up on what Elsberg mentioned, may have mentioned earlier, did mention earlier, understanding what the issue is. So my answer to that question to the young man who put it out there is really make sure you define what the 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 the, the, the issue is and the problem to be solved is. And you saw the little chart I created, the little triangle. Get down to the place where it's not only personal. That's at the bottom level personal mind, body, spirit, but it's systemic because we've got some systemic things that many of us have learned by virtue of what's happened with the George Floyd deal that we didn't know before. In other words, we didn't know, pardon me, we didn't know that all of the kinds of things that had been going on in our, in our social lives were, uh, were, were handicapping us from staying well. So there was a whole systemic set of circumstances that brothers and sisters were bringing to the table that others didn't have to deal with. And they weren't by accident. They were systemic because of policy. So my last point is we got to get to the place where we're talking about policies. And it does require, as Dr. Butler said, we go back and reorient our thinking. Uh, Joe Barker would say it this way. We have to go through a massive paradigm shift. And when you do a paradigm shift, you don't start where you are, you go back to zero and you start building from there. So I wanted to add that in answer to the question that the young man raised because we gotta be sure we're clear about what it is we wanna change and then move very, very smartly to do that at a systemic level. All right, so Nate, let me get you to chime in on that. What is the most effective response we can hope to achieve? And I'm not sure if he's asking, is the response from, uh, you know, uh, the policies or, or the politics or, but what, what is the most effective response we can hope for? And I think we control that on some level. We have to kind of own, not only try to figure out the response, but own our movement. But I, I'll, I'll ask you, what, how do we move in a way to make sure we're reaching our our land of milk and honey? Uh, and should we be really concerned with the response uh, from the other side? Yes. Yeah, so from my standpoint, I think you, you said two things. And the first thing is, what is it that we are actually wanting to achieve? Right. And so for me, I'm, I can only speak for myself. I'm very focused on economic inclusion. And I'm also focused to ensure that um, there's safety for Black Americans. Those are my two interest areas. So the more we are engaged in economics, and you get engaged in economics through access to capital, through politics, through legislation, if, if we get in that space, I mean, again, I'll always say this, our job is not to try to change hearts. I think that Dr. Browder said it best, you know, we're trying to figure out how to operate in a system that has already been. Right? So at the end of the day, what is it that our ask is? And so from my perspective, the ask is economic inclusion. Period. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I, I, I'm hearing that and uh, 
But I think the, the power is in us, right? We have to uh, find our space, like uh, we mentioned earlier, um, we can get up every morning and make history. The first part of making your history is to build your own uh, process to be, uh, to, to, get, to get to your land of milk and honey, right? So if you, uh, economic empowerment, your political uh, actions, your, your education, all those things you control as you begin the process of affecting change outside of your space, your community, your nation, and, and, uh, and the world at large. So Kevin, so, Kevin can, can I just add a point to that? Yes. The significance of making history. It's very difficult to make history if you don't know what your history is. All right. Your history, right? And as John Henry Clark said, if you begin your history in slavery, everything since then looks like progress. We've got to go back to 5,000 years before we were enslaved. That's the oldest documented history of any people on the planet. That is my suggestion of where we begin our study of our history and use that as our historical reference point because it changes our relationship to everything we will encounter in our lives. Yeah, and I think it's important to understand that much of what we've been given, guy named Dr. Nichols said it this way, uh, what happens is the other guys who set the mark, they do what they call, they set as this A prime. They give us Columbus. Exactly. They give us A prime. But A prime is really not A prime. A prime started some other time ago. But every time, and they change the rules on us as well. But my point is, uh, what we're getting here this morning is, is, is significant uh, for us to consider because it means that we also have to change our thinking, if you will. Now, having said that, I want to move towards connecting with the audience a bit, giving them an opportunity to connect with us. And we appreciate the patience and the engagement we hope that we, you've had in capturing and listening and thinking together with us. Um, and there may be other questions. One of the things, Kevin, I think that we can do is we can record and keep all of these questions for the record so that we can, can, can sort through them and maybe even find a way to share them at some point. I won't promise that, but I promise that we can we have the record. So with that being said, I'd like to open up the opportunity for the community of listeners and community of participants along with us to speak to us and talk with us. So at this point, I wanna have the notion of opening up the mics and getting those who are online to speak to us and to share their question uh, to and, and with us and see if we can find uh, a, a decent uh, response for you. So audience so, and, and those who have been listening, would you please speak up and tell us who you are and get uh, uh, an opportunity to share your question or provide your thought. It doesn't have to be a and, question. And before we open up all the mics, if you guys would just hit the raise your hand button uh, before you speak and uh, uh, Preston will, will manage the mute part. Uh, but we do have one question from the panel, from the audience that came in as well. And that question is, uh, does the panel feel there needs to be a single figure to be the voice of the movement? Um, we hear this a lot. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King is gone. Malcolm X is gone. Nobody's leading the African-American community. So the question is, do we, do we need that to make this movement uh, uh, a success, successful and effective. Can I, can I jump in and quickly answer that question? Um, I will. I will say no. Mm -hmm. We do not. Um, and and I will say history teaches us a lesson. If we have a figurehead that is the leader, they end up dead one way or the other. So uh, no, the answer is no. I think every everybody is a leader in one way or the other, because everyone has an influence on someone else, one way or the other. So if you take the ownership as to, okay, just like Dr. Ethelbert indicated, if you take the ownership that, okay, today I woke up, I got to see another day, and this is how I'm going to effectuate change in my individual capacity, then you have put yourself in a leadership role. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take that conscious, mindset that I am going to be a leader. Well, you don't have to even call yourself a leader. Just say, I'm going to, I'm just going to do something today 
you've automatically put yourself put on those leadership shoes. So I would say no. It, it's it's not needed for one person because then their ideology is going to take over whatever the goal is. And change is not just one thing. Change can be a thousand things. But if we have one person as the face of change, then it becomes their ideology becomes change. So no. I, th I think that's the most important, one of the most important questions. And I, I think that I somewhat disagree. And I look at, a, I'm going to look at Hong Kong. I think it is very important sometimes to have a leader who actually is going to make that sacrifice so because some, sometimes what happened that mobilizes more people, I think we also have to look at this leaderless, leaderless thing and tie it in with this particular historical moment. You know, I go back to the Occupy movement that's down at Wall Street where you saw a lot of the, the leaderless. I think you also have to define leaderless at the same time that you have a growing anarchist movement, which does not want to have any sort of leader. OK, you have to look at where these ideas come from. OK, and then you have to understand what leaders do. OK. So sometimes leaders are just symbolic, okay? Sometimes, like for example, you can see the Kamala is a leader affecting a whole generation of women who are, young girls are gonna be coming after, and that's important. Now what happens, going back to what I said about that letter from Birmingham jail, inside that you have all these people running around, you have to have somebody that's going to negotiate. I cannot negotiate with 50 people or 1,000 people. Somebody has to be designated to be oh. that leader, to be that spokesman. Somebody may have to run yeah. for office. Okay? Yeah. okay, that's how the movement works. So it's really, it's really- It's, it's hand know, in it's, hand. It's an interesting question. And I'd ask the audience, to, you know, so we'll move past one. What we have here is a, not an either or, but a both end. Because the reality is, what I'm hearing very clearly is when you step up and step out in the morning, in fact, God gives us life and he gives us the opportunity to do what in fact he's uh, purposed us to do. So it's not an either or, it's really a both end, and it's strategically on both sides. I can't uh, not, I, well, I can't take the, the, the position that I'm off the hook because I'm not in the forefront. You're not off the hook. You got up this morning, God gave you life, you got to move, you got to use, what do you call it, leadership or whatever. So the point I guess I want to make is not an either or, or both ends. Question for all of the audience members. And so listen, a couple comments came in. Even though the thought is not to have a single leader, there should be a unified vision. I think we can all kind of agree to that. Uh, additionally, we don't want we don't want particularly leader um a little throw off. Uh one particular leader, the body of Christ working together is what we need. We all have been uh, uh, been given a specific gift from the body of Christ. So that means all of us have a gift that we can contribute. Um, uh, all right. Uh, Kevin, if I, Kevin, if I could, um, I, I do think, you know, I, one, I don't believe we need one leader, but I do think we're making um, the mistake of clumping this movement into one demographic, though all of us believe in our Lord and, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the, that doesn't mean the whole movement will be moving through Jesus Christ. Uh, so if there's a, most of these leaders come from a church, Malcolm, Martin, uh, say they don't align with them in, in that religion or in, in that spiritual sense, then you lost a big chunk of the movement. Uh, so that's why I don't believe we need one leader. And you, you can also lose the narrative um, through having just one leader. I, one of the rallies I planned was around black women and empowering black women because Breonna Taylor was killed one month before George Floyd, but not many people know that. It wasn't until after George Floyd was killed that Breonna Taylor really came to the forefront. So if there's that one leader who, you know, might not be pushing and advocating for black women in the sense that black women need, then unfortunately they're on the back burner. That's why there, there needs to be different components and sectors within the movement, even though it's one collective action. Good deal, all right, good deal. Now, now let's, uh, let me just do this. For all of those on the panel, not the panel, all those in the audience panel as well, for the audience particularly, why don't you just put in your chat whether you, what, what your thought is, is it one or is it, is, it, is it a collective? I'm not sure I posted that right, but give us your sense there, at least just a matter of capturing it. Kevin, before I do uh, more or other 
then what I plan to do is anything else I need to do to respond to the question you're receiving, because what I'm getting ready to do is to see if there's anyone on the line uh, in, the, in the audience uh, that wants to ask a question uh, beyond the, the chat line. Uh, and I don't know how that happens in terms of the technology, how you make sure people get an opportunity to voice their, their question if they, if they chose to. I don't know, know if that's the fault. We got we we got a hand up, and uh, we also got one more question from from Facebook. But let's go to Kiana Bowie uh, first, and uh, we'll circle back to the uh, Facebook question. Keeping in mind we have uh, eleven thirty stop, um, but if right. we want to keep chatting, I'm okay with that. Okay, I have a ten twenty four here, uh, it's time wise. So go right ahead. What's what's young lady Kiana? Yes. Go um, right. good so thank you for this awesome panel. This has been great. Um, so my question, I want to go, I just want to backtrack just a little bit to something that Mr. Robinson made a comment about. Um, in regards to the importance of a paradigm shift, while I do believe it's essential, my question is, is it necessary to start at zero? Or should we rather um, shift the narrative at the table? While I do recognize that not everyone has a seat at the table, I do believe that that should be the fight to get a seat at the table. And that's where I'm asking if we should have the paradigm shift. Well, I think in order to get with, with Dr. Barlow's talk, when there has to be a paradigm shift, the paradigm shift just means you're trying to change your perspective. You become um, uh, clearer about where you're going. The word I would use, and the word I use in a little cryptic I put together, is strategic. Because here's my my view. I'm a, I'm an OG, as so one guy mentioned. So I, I I'm not I'm not walking properly, but I, I can write and I and I do. So mine is to the pen. My point, though, in answer to your question, Kiana, is that I think it has to be strategic. One of the concerns that I have as an older guy looking is what's next. Yes, but strategically, where do we go? So I think that strategic conversation, whether it's Black Lives Matter or other. <laughs> We've got to do some strategic reflection and thinking and strategic planning that's executed. I don't mean that's done and you just throw it away. Think strategically, operate tactically and effectively. So it's a lot of work involved in it, but strategic leads you to systemic change. That's kind of the formula in my head. So Kiana, does that answer your question a little bit better? Kiana? Thank you. Is that answer okay? Yes. All right. So, so Derek Smith has a question as well. Um, is any other panelists want to respond to Kiana's question or we want to move on? We'll move on. All right. Uh, Derek uh, uh, Smith has a question. Good morning, everybody. And again, yeah, thank you for this very uh, well put together panel. Um, the question that I have, and, and this is directed to um, those that are very closely connected to and tied to politics. Um, when, we, when, when, when we watch these forums, we listen to these forums, we participate in these conversations, I hear a lot of strategic, broad, and general suggestions and, 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 and directives. Uh, my question is, what are those specific list of demands and what are the action steps to get those demands accomplished? Thank you for that question, Derek. And uh, we can, we can punt that over. Let's start with uh, Nate uh, on that one as well as, and then move to Sean and Marlon. Yeah. Great question. Um, I think it, Derek, I think it piggy, piggybacks off of the last question as far as the agenda. And so I'm reminded uh, to a time in 2006, 2007, um, I was probably 25, 26 at the time, and I was downtown marching, right? And I was marching for the Gen 6. And if you remember um, the background on the Gen 6, it was the uh, disparate treatment of black men that were, six men that were, you know, um, at this school. And it's a whole lot of stuff uh, with it. But I bring that up because I was down there marching and I was doing something very similar to what we do, what we've often done as a community and that's been reactive, right? Something happens, then we respond. Something happens, then we respond. And it 
takes away the strategy behind it. And the reason why I bring that up is because when I was down there, we had different people who were marching, we had different people who were speaking, we had different people who were singing. And the one aspect that I remember, I don't remember any of those people and what they said, but I remember this one group and it was this LGBTQ community and they came down there and they stood in solidarity with black people on the specific reason why we was there. And I'll never forget a lot of people in the black community were like, well, why are they here? Why are they here? And I watched two years later after the election of Barack Obama and I watched them move into the White House with their singular agenda and over the last 10 years, I have watched their community grow and get access, rights, and everything else in a way and at a speed that I have not seen any other demographic get. So to answer that, I think it goes back to the previous question. What are we rallying around? And there needs to be a singular agenda, even if there is not a single leader that's moving it. So what is our singular agenda? Let's be proactive in that planning. And so, for instance, even from the political side, you know, there's people who have, you know, issues with the um, with the Democratic Party. There are a lot of people who have issues with the Republican Party. But if the Dems do get the White House, take your issues to the side. But on January 20th, 2021 at 1201, what are our asks? If we, you got our vote then you want to keep our vote. And we have to be critical to those that we put in power. So singular agenda would be my response. One comment though, Sean. Let me, let me also say, Kevin, if I might, one of the things that folks, that, and your question, Derek, is a perfect, perfect place to put it, is that we intend on next week to offer up what we're calling an action agenda to answer the question that you raised, that is the specific suggestions of what should you do, what would you do, uh, what could you do? So you, you, you're thinking ahead with us as we'd ask you to do, what's next? And one of the things that we've thought about now, we also welcome your, your thoughts about the answer to that question because what is the action agenda? And again, it could be have a multiplicity of, of, um, of not just applications, but, but perspectives. But I, I thank you for that question. And it gives us uh, energy to, to make sure we answer that question even more specifically next week for you and for others. Because I think you've pointed to one that says, well, tell us what to do. What is it that we should do? And you may not be asking quite in that way, but that's what we're thinking. Does that fit with what you're thinking, sir? Derek, is that Absolutely. fit? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, and for the last, you know, four or five, six months of, you know, everything that's been going on, these panels have happened across the country. I've been a part of them. And that specific question is the same question that I've been asking. And I love your response. And I look forward to seeing that. Very Thank good. You. That sounds great. Thank you, sir. Sean, give us a couple of uh, comments, Marlon. Then I'm going to come to Ethelbert and Dr. Browder in a different way with the same question. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I also piggyback off what Nate said, being proactive versus reactive. And I, I can't, I think we all have our own different agendas. Um, we all have different things that move us. I can speak for myself. My biggest thing was criminal justice and criminal justice reform. So I will let you know how I decided to, what was my list of demands and my action steps. What I did was I determined if that is my biggest thing, then I need to go to law school. If my issue is criminal justice, I need to go to law school. After law school, what I decided to do was if my biggest thing, because I think we, we ultimately, we, and again, uh, Mr. Robinson, I'm not gonna give, give a spoiler alert for next week, but <laughs> well, what we ultimately do, we need to know how the system works. So if you do not know how the system works, then you're always going to be on the outside looking in. You have to infiltrate the system. So your action step is first, find out what intrigues you. What is your issue? Then infiltrate the system and see exactly how it works. So not only now do you have the information and you know how it works, but then you can go back and teach everybody else how it works. So my action plan has always been, 
I was a former prosecutor, so I know how the criminal justice system works. Now I'm in the civil world and I know how that works. What, I, what I'm personally doing is making sure I get as many African-American men through law school and getting them into the state's attorney's office so they also know how the system works. I think it's an individual thing. You find out what vexes you and what you want to do about change. Learn that system, teach everybody else, and let them do the exact same thing. Repeat, repeat, repeat until everybody around you knows what their issue is. That's, that's my action. Thanks for that, Sean. Hey, Marlon, from the political perspective, since you're in that arena and as well as uh, being uh, at the NAACP, can you can you address that a little bit? For yeah, I have, um, you know, I think, Derek, that's a great question. I have a bit of a unique, um, I'm in a unique position because I do work for an elected official, but I am also a community activist and I'm a part of NAACP. Uh, and when you put all three of those realms into one room, um, like Sean was saying, you know, you're going to have different points of views and, and different um, action items. But what you can agree on, you need to move forward on those. And that's not saying just a table to rest, but you need to find the best way to hold feet to the fire. Um, as Nate was saying, you know, someone might get your vote, but it's your job to hold them accountable. Don't just disappear into the background. So stay active in the community, um, whether it's you know, doing these panels, whether it's uh, joining an organization, uh, but, you know, organization and community drive really is what, especially in local and state politics, is really what will make the most immediate change, um, especially for the African-American community, in my opinion. All right. So, uh, Dr. Browder and Utherberg, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, it appears to me, as I learned the history of the civil rights movement, that it seemed like those guys had all their ducks in a row. They knew what they were asking uh, going into the to the movement. Is that a true statement? And do we see this likeness as we move uh, through this new Black Lives Matter movement? Are we? Uh, do we know what the ask is, or do we feel like we know what the ask is, or do we feel like we're just uh, moving uh, uh, based on what we're seeing and being react react react? Well, I think it goes back to what I said earlier. You know, in my opening remarks. You know. Young people, you know, were leading these movements. You know, we go back and look at, you know, so right, but they were very young people, okay? And, um, you know, they made mistakes. Uh, I still think one of the best books of the civil rights movement, if you want to look at it in, in, in terms of strategy and organization, is James Foreman, The Making of Black Revolutionaries. That's still a classic of how to do. Um, and it's a book that I'm surprised is not on everybody's reading list. You know, uh, I remember, for example, when James Foreman was here living in Washington, D.C., whenever I saw him walking down Columbia Road, I told my kids who were very young at that time, I said, do you know who that is? That's a very important man. Understand who it is. And, and you know, to hear his name not mentioned, you know, the way people are honoring, um, you know, John Lewis, you know, I, I, find, I find it very interesting who we remember. OK, because what happens is there's a lot of people just like with the women. You know, that's why I mentioned Septima Clark. You know, I mentioned Ella Baker, because what happens is that we forget that these are people who made mistakes. They made mistakes. That's how you learn. That's what struggle about. You do things and you make mistakes. And, it's, and it, it is a long distance race. OK, and then this is where I bring Baraka in, in terms of our culture. It's the changing same. It seems like, yes, we've been doing it all the same, yeah. But listen to John Coltrane playing my favorite things and, and tell me if it's the same, my, my favorite things. You see what I'm saying? Our movement, and this is the motion of history, it changes, but it's the same thing. Yes, you've probably been in meetings over and over. It seems like it's the same thing. But listen carefully. If you're a musician, you know it's different. Nobody, Miles Davis never plays the same thing the same way again. OK, and that's what we have to learn when we're out there. It may sound similar. I may get bored of hearing the same thing, but it ain't the same thing. OK, it's a little different, a little improvisation. And that's the key in terms of moving forward and, and, and making history. I would say that um, we lack a clear narrative, a clear understanding of the civil rights movement. Uh, very few people understand that um, majority of black people weren't with King during the movement. Majority of black ministers were not with King during that movement. They thought he was an outsider. They thought he was a troublemaker. And, um, and, and so it wasn't until <laughs> King had to expand his understanding of the issue. And mm -hmm. he didn't do that until after Malcolm was assassinated. 
Right. And when he made the speech at Riverside Church a year to the day which he was assassinated, that's when he expanded his consciousness. And as a result of the expansion of his consciousness, his financial stream dried up. He spent the last year of his life struggling before he was murdered. So we've got to put all of this into context. Uh, one last point that I want to make too, uh, with regards to the issue of leadership, for 20 some odd years, I would do uh, workshops at the uh, Children's Defense Fund annual um, Freedom School events. And they would, and, and the civil rights movement was a part of that. They, they, the organizers came out of that. And as I began to question the history of the civil rights movement and the history of these organizations, what I found was that most people didn't know the history. Most people couldn't answer the questions, the fundamental questions that I was asking them. And, and one of my key questions was, how did all of these leaders get organized? And it wasn't until I became aware of the Highland Research Center that I came to understand that there was a group of people who brought a young Martin Luther King, young Andy Young, um, all, uh, uh, all of the people who were uh, lieutenants and generals in the civil rights movement went through this process, went through this training and were given marching orders. And out of that came either uh, servant leaders or self-serving leaders. All right. All right. And these All right. are the issues that we're still dealing with right now. If you have servant leaders, they understand very clearly what the larger agenda is and their role in that larger agenda. So the servant leaders can come together and select someone from their group to represent them as a whole. And they know how to hold that person accountable when they betray their interests. So these are issues that we have forgotten yeah. or I'm, have I'm never you. learned. Yeah. And as a consequence, mm -hmm. we're still yeah. arguing or asking questions that we should have learned a long time ago. Tony, I'm so happy you mentioned the Highlander because you can see that that does not get mentioned. That's where Rosa Parks, you know, yeah, came through absolutely. there. But the other thing about King, go back. I think it was Edie Nixon who was a Pullman cup for her. King, when he was among her, he didn't want to lead the march. He didn't want to lead the march. But he got a phone call, said, well, we want, he said, I, I don't know. I, you know, I got a new baby, I got a wife, this and that, I'm new in town. And then he said, well, I'll, let me think about it. When they called him back that evening, he, he said, well, okay, I'll go with him. And the guys, Edie Nixon said, well, that's good because the meeting's in your church. <laughs> you know, he put the meeting in his church, but he was reluctant. And he was saying he, was, he, was, he had a young family and baby. And this is when they were bombing people's homes. You know, and he Derek, had a lot to risk. And Derek, let me just say this. I'm talk, talking to Derek Smith now. One of the things that you're hearing, and hopefully you recorded in your thinking, is simply the notion of being clear and helping the leader be clear. This is kind of one of the action pieces and the questions that you would ask. Be clear about um, the, the, the the kind of leadership perspective that a person has. I have a book that I wrote, and I haven't said a lot about my background, but it may have been up there somewhere. I, I've written a book called The Skills of an Effective Leader. And one of the things that a leader has to do is to have character. And a part of the definition of that notion of being having character is they have to understand who they are. That's the problem we have even right now and have to understand what their motives are. And I have to understand what their habits are. Habits have taken down more leaders than you can name. Not knowledge, not skills, not ability. You can go back to my back. Brother was bad, I met him personally, but his habits ate him up. So I'm just saying, when you, get, when you ask the question, what is it that I need to be clear about? What does I need to do? You need to vet the person who's gonna be the leader. You have to vet them, what you are, will show itself. You do have to question it. If you see it and it doesn't seem to walk like it's talking. And, and, and be genuine because not only are you holding, holding them accountable, her accountable, you're helping them get better. Now, I don't help you if I get you at a cliff and don't tell you you're at a cliff. You may not like the fact that I just told you, but you need to know what you need to know. I hope that makes sense with you. You've heard from a couple of guys who have helped you frame at least a part of the action agenda or the questions that you have. As you think about investing your energy and your time is the thing you suggest as well. So anyway. Brother Bernard, we yeah. got, I got one last question from Facebook and I really want to get it out there. All right, good deal. And I'd like everybody to kind of chime in in any order that you desire. And then and we the, get, question, the question is, uh, now more than ever, there are many Caucasians who share your outrage at the inequality. 
What's the most effective thing that your Caucasian sisters and brothers can do to support and make the change? I'll open it up to the, to the panelists to go in order, any order they desire. I'll jump out there. What difference does it matter? Like, I hate, I hate to answer a question with a question, but I find myself doing it quite often. What difference does it matter? Whether you're white, black, green, yellow, purple, orange, whatever it may be, if you if your goal and your thought process or this individual is saying, look, I want to be there to assist you, what difference does it matter? Again, I, you know, I, I hate to beat a dead horse, but a, your enemy is not flesh and blood. It will never be flesh and blood. That's biblical. That's stamp. I, I can't say that hard enough. So if you have someone that is there that is saying, look, as a human being, I see the hum humanity in you and I see the struggle that you're facing as well. How can I help? Then bring them along. Come along. Let me share. I don't know what they might even come across with because I've had friends of mine that are Caucasian said, look, how, how can I help? And literally, I just simply told them, be you. I do not need you to try to act you know, African-American, try to be down, whatever. Just be you as a human being. You show concern because you see another human being suffering or a group of human beings suffering. Just continue to show that concern and be you and teach that to somebody else because hate is not within us. Hate is, is taught. So if you're a light and you're teaching light to somebody else, then guess what? You just helped out immensely. Mm -hmm. So... It, it, to me anyway, and this is my opinion, it doesn't make a difference. If they're there to help, let them help. Yeah, I'd like to chime in on that. Um, I think that one of the areas that, um, that I would offer to our Caucasian brothers and sisters is not to be silent because silence is um, agreement, agreement. And so when you have situations where you see oppression and you see inequality, if you're quiet, then you're a part of the problem. And so one of the things that I would offer is there's a book called White Fragility. It's written by uh, Robin D'Angelo. And what she talks about is that the biggest problem when it comes to race inequality is not the white races. It's the white people who think that they're woke, but don't necessarily stand up and speak against the inequality. They see it, they recognize, but they don't use their power and they don't use their privilege to evoke and um, exacerbate change. So I would say it's a little bit more than that. Like you really need to speak up. If you see something that's wrong, say something. You know, it's, it's kind of like in the criminal justice system. If you see something, say something. Be a snitch, speak, use your voice, use your influence. Yeah, and Nathaniel, I want to say I, I absolutely agree with that because one of the issues that Believers, uh, some believers, myself being one, I have is that what have been called, quote unquote, the evangelicals, they have not stood up for Jesus. Not, not for me, but for Jesus. And I've written, in fact, a piece that talks about the notion of when are you going to speak up? Because, in fact, you're in a position to speak up and have more influence than I would. And King talked about it in his writing as well, as we've spoken about in terms of the letter. You know, you're silent. What's that silence all about? If I'm your brother and you're my brother, how do you stand silent when you see someone attacking your very belief system because they happen to have some perspective that you're concerned about protecting? What's the deal with that? You know, anyway, so so then, Kevin, here, here's the deal. Um, we, we're at 1147. Yeah, we're gonna let uh, let's let the rest of the panel answer that question. I like to get those responses, yes, and then we go then we're gonna move to closing out. Absolutely, wonderful. Got gotcha. you. Go uh, yeah, so I'll I'll jump in. Um, you know, that's a great question. Uh, one that you know I think we get more in Northern Virginia than most other places probably get. Um, I you know, I believe Stokely Carmichael is the one who said racism isn't a black problem; it's a white problem, but it becomes a black problem when the power to be inhumane is given to white people. And that means the white power structure has to speak out against the power that they hold and that they benefit from. So if, if white people giving equality and equity to black people does not mean you're losing equality and equity. 
You know, it, that's, it's not a pie. That's not how it works. So they need to understand their position and their power to speak up, speak out, and, and call out racism, whether it's in their own home, in their own community, in their own backyard. And that's, that's an uncomfortable conversation. Um, but until you're ready to have those uncomfortable conversations about the power structure, uh, then there, there's not much that can be done. Brother Ethelberg. Okay, Dr. Browder. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Carter Jewison in 1933 wrote a book entitled The Miseducation of the Negro. One very basic and fundamental reality is everybody has been miseducated, not just Negroes. White folks, we don't know American history, we don't know world history. What I can tell you from our own personal experiences as a result of COVID and the George Floyd protests uh, is that uh, as, a, as a historian, as a writer, in conversation with other writers, in conversation with uh, bookstore owners, that there has been a run on black books. Unlike any time it's been within the last decade, my business since March has increased 720%. And the majority of people who are buying books about black history, American history, world history are white folk. And they're learning now for the first time the world in which they've lived. That's why there's so many white people all over the world out there marching because they realize how miseducated they have been. So the key to solving many of the problems that we will always be confronted with is knowledge. The more knowledge you have about the world in which you are living, how it came to be, gives you the ability to develop the strategies that will help you negotiate that world in the present moment and the future. And the last thing that I'll say is that one of the things that I've been talking about for decades is that if you aren't thinking seven generations ahead, seven generations in, in the future, at least 150 years, you're wasting air. So that level of consciousness has to be cultivated and it's not gonna be done in schools. It's not gonna be done, and let's be real, it, it has not been done in churches, it has not been done in fraternities or sororities. If we're going to make our way out of this, then groups of people have to begin to strategize on how they can create safe places where people can come together and cultivate the consciousness that will allow us to think seven generations into the future and create the future that our children's children's children will inherit. Until we think on that level, we will always be subservient to other people. And, and, and Dr. Dr. Brown, if I might, um, one of the ideas that I've been playing with and throwing around in my own head, uh, I used to be a community organizer many years ago in DC. One of the things that I thought about in terms of these basic pieces is that there's a need for what I kind of call liberation university. Mm -hmm. And liberation university essentially captures the notion of understanding what in fact uh, is required to be liberation in your thinking and in your operating. So this whole consciousness thing. Um, and again, thinking well ahead because what we're doing now, unless we do the changes and I'm okay with the young folks carrying it forward, but what do we do for the children that you've got? Some of you have children. What do they do with the children they're gonna have? I suggest we need to have a liberation university where things that are taught, almost like, if you will, a great courses kind of deal, where you don't have to go to college per se, there can be a college or university, but you can find the information you need, uh, Tony, both white, black, and otherwise, readily accessible through a, through a CD, through all the media that's a part of proof. But that whole notion of liberation university, because I'm not as smart about black history and the, and, the, and the stuff that you mentioned this morning, as I would think I should be at my age. I got some degree of things that I may think I know a little bit, but I don't know nothing. And so I've got a lot to learn from the young people on the line and the middle-aged people on the line and the older people on the line. So this is a rich and, and, and terrific opportunity for us um, to think about things that should be thought about. Okay, I'll, I'll just kind of defer to you and say, we, we got about 11.53, we need to give everybody 
everybody looks like they've had an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, we need to collect the, the, the thoughts of people that, you know, that send them in and, and hold on to them. Um, I'd love to ask the, the, I'd love to kind of close in a good way, but I'd also like to ask the, the, uh, the, 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 the participants online to shoot us a note about what you thought about this conversation and what you'd like to see more of. Long, tall order. Just send us such a quick chat. Uh, Derek, we got you clearly uh, in terms of what you asked about. But send us any thoughts you have about this conversation today. Because what we're going to do, if you will, we're going to get together next Saturday. And uh, we have to do what I kind of call uh, cover the rest of the story, as I mentioned this morning. Uh, the rest of the story involves not only giving answer to the kinds of things that would be an action agenda, but the rest of the story would be giving us a chance to conclude around this notion of what's next for the African-American community. We'll be still considering that. And there's several points there as well. Uh, Nate mentioned the word empowerment, but educational. Education is one of the topics. Politics is also one of the topics. Economic empowerment, moving forward, question and answers, and we'll have a close, some closing remarks from your pastors. So don't miss next week. If you do miss next week, you miss the rest of the story. So let me be positive. Be here next week so you don't miss the rest of the story. I hope you've enjoyed this morning's conversation. I hope you've enjoyed the opportunity to do some summit learning together. We can't thank each of the panelists enough for what they've provided in terms of just context and perspective. And so we've started something here, Kevin, that uh, we'll have to even consider what's next for this kind of panel summit discussion. I have crazy thoughts sometimes, and my thought was, this should be around the country, these conversations, not necessarily in the churches only, but these conversations that allow us to have an opportunity to get folks to think about what Dr. Browder said in terms of we all got to change this vision in our mindset. So I don't know. Um, my mind races like that. So um, we'll see. But certainly, I want to thank every uh, panelist this morning, and I want to thank every member in the audience, Facebook and otherwise, for being here with us, sharing your thoughts. And again, uh, we enjoy and we appreciate and welcome your feedback. And I know we can't be there with you, but I hope that you're giving at least a, a little bit of an applause to the, to the panel for the work they've done. And, and if you will, Go ahead and give them an applause. We can't know what it is. But anyway, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for sharing with us. I hope that you found this to be a very valuable, uh, and if, if, if you will, even significant uh, expenditure of your time because you've got good stuff here this morning. We've had good learning together. We've learned together in the summit on what uh, is next. And what is next for you? What is next for what and who you lead? What is next for your community? What is next for your church? Let's get, as I say, the rest of the story and get positioned to answer the question. So between now and next week, think about that. What's next? Brother Bernard, thank you so much. And let's shout out to Preston for holding it down to the technology. And again, our panelists, we really appreciate you, Justin Persons and uh, Shaman Smalls, our ministry leader of the Zion Woodbridge Men's Ministry. And to the audience, we really appreciate everything. Everything has been recorded, so we'll be able to respond to everyone uh, without question in next week's uh, summit chat. So with that, have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. We were planning for 90, but we did two, and we didn't lose more than two people. So this is an exciting uh, conversation, and I'm looking forward to next week. Very good at me as well. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Take care. All right. Thanks, Take everybody. Off. Okay. Have a good week, too, man. Be safe. Yep. Yes,